We've got a lot to talk about in this one, so I ain't gonna waste any time. My name is Ben, and this is Comic Book Breakdown episode 10.9, Mortal Coil. Issue 11 starts off in the cooler, Ivan Pushkin's subterranean dungeon. This is Jim Chung's first time drawing the cooler, so we have some minor art inconsistencies when compared with the last issue. Maverick is no longer chained to a brace that's attached to the ceiling, he's just chained by his wrists. His torn shirt is gone, his torn pants are back to his costumes pants, and his bandaged feet are now booted feet. The torch that Pushkin left behind still flickers, but it reveals Krasnogranitsky, a.k.a. the Red Guardian. The Red Guardian is basically Russia's answer to Captain America. He's a patriotic superhero, although the Red Guardian doesn't typically have superpowers. Maverick isn't impressed by Granitsky, as he knew the previous Guardian, Alexei Shostakov, who died on a mission while saving Captain America and the Black Widow. What is this pretender doing here? So Granitsky explains that he's an inspired Russian, and with the loss of Shostakov, he felt his countrymen needed someone they could look up to. Someone who would stand up against greed and corruption, and inspire pride and hope in their country. And sure, he wanted that man to be him. But while surveilling Pushkin's operations, Granitsky overheard the plan to rob AIM and to hire Omega Red. Unfortunately, he was captured before he could do anything about it. And so now he's here. Only Pushkin's fear of the Guardian's allies has kept him alive. Maverick finds some of Granitsky's story hard to believe. Why would someone want to inspire others to fight for hope? Cynical Maverick doesn't understand Granitsky's motivation. After all, he fights for money or for survival. But he can believe this stuff about Pushkin. If Pushkin steals those weapons, he'll keep what he needs, sell the rest and this would further solidify his hold on Russia's crime scene. He has to be stopped, and Granitsky agrees. But first, they need to escape. Maverick begins to swing on his chains. He has some thoughts about that. You see, the dampening effect in his shackles is just that. It's quieting his powers, but not canceling them out. He thinks that if he can get a source of kinetic energy, then maybe he can build up enough of a charge to free himself. So... Maverick swings back and forth until he can wrap his legs around a stalactite, and then he starts slamming his manacled hands against the ceiling. This might uh, take a while. Uh. Man, what an expositional opening. A lot of that is necessary, though, so I forgive Gonzalez for it. Remember, we learned about Pushkin's scene at the end of issue 10. Remember, we learned about Pushkin's scheme at the end of issue 10, but Maverick still had no clue. Sure, he knew that Pushkin was up to something, but he had no idea what or when. Gonzalez also had to introduce the concept of the Red Guardian to us, hence why he went on so long about being an altruistic guy just trying to make Russia a better place. This dude is Maverick's new ally for this caper, and we need to trust him, even if Maverick doesn't. Fun fact, Krasno Graninsky is the Russianized name Donovan Grant, a.k.a. Red, from the Bond novel From Russia With Love. When I said that this book was inspired by spy games more than superheroes, I meant it. This doesn't mean that there aren't problems here, though. First off, The Guardian is new to us. Assuming that this is not only our first Maverick comic, but our first comic ever, but he isn't new to Maverick. Maverick claimed to know Shostakov, who worked for slash with the Russian government. If there's a new Red Guardian, then it would make sense for him to have a similar arrangement. However, despite saying that he has a background in covert operations, Graninsky appears to be a vigilante, working solo and without the consent of Mother Russia. Which is kind of stupid on the part of author Gonzalez, because the Guardian states that Pushkin is keeping him alive because he may have told his allies about Pushkin's operations. But why would that then necessitate keeping Granitsky alive? Imagine you're a Russian crime lord. You're meeting, uh, 
hold on. <clears throat> you're meeting with known mutant killer and former Soviet super soldier Omega Red when your men inform you that they've captured the Red Guardian. You smile to cover your fear. Excellent. Let us torture him until he breaks, you say. But he is a true believer and doesn't break. Now... A former Soviet counterintelligence operative yourself, you know the government sponsored the Red Guardian. Is this man working for them? Did he contact anyone else? If not, then you can kill him at your leisure. If so, then you'll have to change your plans, but kill him now. Right? Why did Pushkin keep Grinitsky alive? You and I know that it's so that he can help Maverick take down Pushkin in this story, but I can't see a single reason why Pushkin would allow that to happen. And to chain Maverick right next to him? Again, there will be one story moment in this book where Pushkin feels cunning and clever, and then there will be like four more where he makes these classic stupid bad guy moves. Why didn't he change his plans after the Red Guardian discovered them? Especially since he changed his plans! We're told that Pushkin was going to buy weapons from AIM, but then he switches to the stealing plan because he's smart. But why not have Pushkin switch to stealing them because of the Red Guardian? AIM's timetable could have been too slow, so Pushkin wanted to get those weapons now, before Guardian's theoretical backup arrives, so he plans to rob them instead. Gonzalez could have even had Pushkin hire Omega Red in order to surprise and maybe sacrifice him to, any bonus forces that this job might encounter. That would have kept Pushkin feeling like more of a strategist who can adjust his plans quickly, rather than an idiot who runs around doing plans that the government might have intelligence of. And even then, he still should have killed Granitsky. I'm vaguely annoyed that Maverick didn't even blink at Omega Red being involved in this. While I'm sure that Maverick didn't expect Red to stay buried forever, this is the first time that the pair will encounter each other since the Maverick one-shot. He should at least, like, say damn or something. But I'm really annoyed at how Gonzalez plans Maverick's escape. I'm actually cool with the dampeners lessening Maverick's powers instead of shutting them off completely. They are dampeners, after all, not inhibitors. But Maverick also tells Grinitsky about his relapse, and guesses that maybe his body's weird reaction to the legacy virus has something to do with why the dampeners don't work. No! It doesn't! Or at least, it doesn't have to, Jesus Christo! The dampener explanation worked fine. We don't need Mr. McArmchair Science Man to throw a conspiracy onto the fire, too. This feels like Gonzalez trying to be too clever about this breakout. Oh, hmm, uh, see, it's Maverick's powers interacting with the legacy virus which interacts with the dampeners, uh, yes, that allows his powers to work. Excellent. You f- No swearing. Fucking nerd. Just say that the dampeners weakened Maverick's powers, so where one punch would charge him up before, he now needs, like, 100 punches to charge up. That's fine, that works. In the words of Utada Hikaru, it's simple and clean, and that's a good thing. That's what we want. Not complicated and messy. <sighs> and Pushkin still should have killed Graditsky. Okay, moving on. In Pushkin's command center, the big man divvies out work orders. They know where Ames' base is hidden, and they'll head out soon to attack. First, Hammer, Sickle, and Omega Red are told to distribute crates to the barracks. Omega Red asks what's in them, and Hammer bristles at this. Omega Red is the hired muscle, not the detective, so stop questioning the master. But Omega Red actually did that for our benefit, because we don't know what's in those crates. So Pushkin reveals another layer to his plan. Hammer, Sickle, and Omega Red will stay in their normal uniforms, while the rest of Pushkin's forces will dress as Hydra soldiers. This will keep AIM from blaming Pushkin and create even more of a wedge between the two terrorist groups. This is what I'm talking about. This is smart. This is cunning. This is a good plan. But then consider that Hammer and Sickle are going dressed as themselves and their known confederates of Pushkin. 
So now AIM will think that Hydra is attacking them and that Pushkin either lent or sold his aid to Hydra? Ugh. In the cooler, Maverick's stalactite punching finally pays off. With a burst of pink energy, Maverick's hands become superheated, melting through his shackles with ease, and somehow none of that molten metal falls on him. Grunitsky is shocked by this as Maverick stands back up. He stumbles over to Grunitsky's shackles and presses a hand on them. Once Red Guardian is freed, the pair go to the exit, and Maverick is able to super punch the door open. The two guards at the door are downed easily, and, having spent all of his charge, Maverick's hands return to normal. The pair stash the guards and carefully head outside. From a nearby slope? Wall? The first shot looks like a slope, but then the second panel looks like a wall. I'm not sure what it is, but Maverick and Guardian are surveying what's going on regardless of their location. The Guardian knows that there is a hangar hidden in one of the farmhouses, and it is looking busy. It must be getting close to go time. Maverick agrees. They'll have to slip aboard the transport and, once at their destination, stop Pushkin and destroy Ames' weapon cache. The Guardian nods. Cool, sounds like a plan. They head down the slope, or wall, but Maverick isn't headed toward the hangar. Guardian asks him, WTF is he doing? Maverick explains that he needs his gear. He is heading back to the main house to get it. Red Guardian thinks that this is foolish, but he can't really stop Maverick either. He'll wait for Maverick as long as he can, but if he sees an opening, then he will take it. Maverick does indeed return to the manor, although he admits that he has no clue where he's going. There have got to be like 40 rooms in this place, and whoops! Maverick ducks around a corner as he spots two armed guards. The element of surprise is the only weapon that he has right now, and he can't blow it. He ducks inside of a room and carefully closes the door. When he startles, Natalia Kedrov, the mistress whose hands Pushkin shattered last issue. She shouts, You? and backs away into an art piece that falls and shatters, summoning the guards. The two guards that Maverick just dodged run into the room, rifles at the ready. Doing so hides Maverick behind the door accidentally, and Natalia covers for him. She holds up her hands, blaming her own clumsiness for the shattered art. One of the guards mentions how dangerous things have been lately. He runs a gloved hand against her cheek. It's too bad that she has to be alone and fend for herself. Natalia slaps his hand away. Do they want her to tell Pushkin about them touching her? She orders them to get out, and, aware of what happened to the last guy who assaulted one of Pushkin's mistresses, they leave. Maverick steps out from behind the door. Why did she do that? Natalia explains that Ivan has been crueler lately than he has been before. She saw Maverick's escape attempt and how he surrendered in order to save that child. That kid was Natalia's nephew, and she has a debt to repay. Maverick asks her if she knows where his armor was being held, and she not only tells him that, but he succeeds in retrieving it with no trouble. Maverick then uses login information that she gave him to get into one of Pushkin's computers, because I guess in order to make themselves even, Dahlia has to help Maverick bring down Pushkin's operation. But that's fine, that's fine. He's trying to find anything that might help him stop Pushkin, and he finds a weapons manifest. Maverick is horrified at what he finds on that list. There's some really dangerous stuff on there, including stealth missiles capable of dispersing anthrax. He postulates that if Pushkin released those over, say, Hamburg, it could kill three million people. Easy. So now we have some stakes. It's easy and vague to say that Pushkin is stealing some weapons, and it really lacks impact. But knowing that a man like Pushkin could kill millions if he felt the need? That's way more frightening especially when we've just had two different instances of people confirming that Pushkin is crueler than he has been before. That's pretty scary. Checking the computer also reveals information about Major Barrington. Okay, this is the good stuff. Here will be the only details about... about... nothing. 
Pushkin's suggestion that Barrington was involved with Janetta was all a lie, built by the crime lord so that he could better control Maverick. Maverick rests his head in his hands. So when he last saw Barrington, when he accused his old friend, scared him so much that he fell over, there was nothing to that. Maverick curses himself for a fool and wishes Barrington a peaceful rest. Then he clips on his face mask. Hammer is going to pay for killing Barrington, and so will Pushkin for giving the order. Maverick then meets with the Red Guardian, they sneak aboard the transport craft, and away they go into our next issue. So, anyone who took my bet about Natalia being a spy, give yourself 20 comic book breakdown bucks to be redeemed in our gift shop before you exit the building. We've got pencil topper slinkies, all kinds of good stuff, you're gonna love it, kids. Joking aside, while I am disappointed in Natalia's lack of spy osity, I do like that she turns out to be a sympathetic character. Maverick does question her about why she spit on him last issue, and even she recognizes that Ivan is a cruel man. Accepting Maverick's help during that scene would have put him in even greater danger, so you're welcome for saving your life. And I like this because it immediately rounds out Natalia's character a bit more. Sure, she is sleeping and living with a crime lord, but she still feels pity and mercy. I don't like her then doing this because Maverick helped to save her nephew. Now she isn't a good person trapped in crappy circumstances, she is a cynical person repaying a debt. I suppose an argument could be made that Natalia is a complicated person, motivated by reasons both selfless and selfish, but I don't want a well-built background character, I want a well-built leading character, and we are lacking in that department. Maverick retrieves his armor, but he gives no reason for doing so to Red Guardian. When Red Guardian is like, What do you need your armor? Are you nuts? We have a plan to stop? Maverick doesn't reply that he isn't bulletproof, or that he doesn't want Pushkin putting another person in the armor and besmirching his name. Part of the reason that this happens is because this is a comic book, and we like our costumed heroes, so fine. He needs to get back in it, but give him a reason. I would have bought Maverick saying, is your costume bulletproof? And Red Guardian goes, yes. And Maverick says, so is mine, and I'm going to go get it. That's at least practical, which fits Maverick's nature well, and leads into the dangerous situation that they're about to go into. We also get the big reveal that Maverick accused Barrington over nothing, and yeah, it changes nothing. Maverick did swear vengeance on Hammer, I suppose, which he hadn't done yet, but Maverick is already going against Pushkin's forces, so he'll be fighting Hammer anyways. There's just so much going on here that feels unnecessary or unconnected. Like, we have this scene where he figures out Barrington's past, but that has no impact on what we're currently doing, and that's super frustrating. Resolving the Barrington plotline added nothing, and it could have, I promise you. I can, man, I can feel a rewrite percolating in my mind. It's coming, folks. Oh, yes, it is a coming. First, we gotta finish this off. Pushkin Stealth Craft opens issue 12 above the Swiss Alps, just north of Liechtenstein. Hammer, flying the plane with Omega Red as co-pilot, calls Sickle in the back of the plane. They're approaching the drop zone. Tell the men to get ready. Sickle confirms that the men, now dressed in Hydra uniforms, are ready to go. So Hammer opens the cargo bay doors, and they drop. Armed with rocket packs and energy rifles, which is always going to get a kick out of me, the practice troops launch this assault and make easy work of AIM's leading defenses. As the ground forces do their work, Hammer is contacted by Pushkin and informed of Maverick and Red Guardian's escape, and that they might possibly be on the plane. Hammer informs Sickle of this, and he's more than happy to kill Maverick, but Omega Red wants him more, and he dashes out of the cockpit. Meanwhile, Maverick notices that Red Guardian is looking a little air sick. You okay, bud? This guy said that he has field experience, right? Maverick questions. Red Guardian assures him that he'll be fine once he's on the ground. This causes Maverick to voice and doubt his trust in Red Guardian. 
Thankfully, Red Guardian has similar concerns about Maverick. Neither knows the other man very well, and so the trust is a little thin here. However, both men also know what is at stake, and how bad it would be for Pushkin to get the weapons that he wants. Red Guardian is willing to do whatever he has to in order to stop Pushkin. Even die. Can he trust Maverick to do the same? Before Maverick can answer, Sickle slams a door open, totally announcing his presence, but <laughs> I love this. Omega Red literally shoves him out of the way so that he can get to Maverick, just barrels through the guy. Omega Red's tendrils smash through wooden crates, leaving Red Guardian for Sickle. Of course, Omega Red starts demanding the location of the carbonadium synthesizer, and even Maverick can't believe that he's still on that, but he keeps dodging anyways, aware that Omega Red's bulky body puts him at a disadvantage in the cramped space. The same is true for Sickle, whose long handle and weapon maneuver poorly. Maverick checks on Red Guardian, who decks Sickle, but that lets Omega Red wrap a coil around Maverick's ankle. He then smashes Maverick against a wall, unaware that Maverick's powers have been reactivated. The sudden impact charges Maverick up, and he super punches Omega Red away from him. In the cockpit, Hammer has received word from the ground troops that they've cleared a landing site. He activates the craft's VTOL capabilities, or vertical takeoff and landing. This tosses everyone else around, breaking up the fight. Maverick opens one of the bay doors and calls to the Red Guardian, and they GTFO. Omega Red makes to follow them, but Sickle holds his weapon out to stop him. He isn't here to settle a grudge or a vendetta. He's here to do a job. Omega Red needs to join the Alpha Squad, take the base's command center, and then raid the munitions depot. And if he doesn't, Pushkin will live up to the Ivan the Terrible nickname. Omega Red grits his teeth. Fine, he'll do the job. But if Sickle gets in his way again, he will be sharing a grave with Maverick. Ooh, you tell him, Red. Gonzalez gets issue 12 off to an explosive and action-packed opening. Our last two issues were relatively slow, so I won't lie, Omega Red and Sickle discovering and attacking Maverick so quickly kind of got me off guard. But in a good way. We've seen Omega Red's single-mindedness in regards to Maverick before, in the one-shot, and it is back on display here. Nothing else matters to Omega Red more than the carbonadium synthesizer and getting his revenge on Maverick. He barrels past Sickle, he trashes the interior of the plane, and he nearly ditches the job to go after Maverick. That all feels right for Omega Red's character, and Chung's penchant for details makes him look pretty cool. His tendrils smash around the environment with lots of details. I love it. It actually feels like he's utilizing his tendrils as weapons, as opposed to just an extension of his arms. Sickle is surprisingly competent at reining Omega Red in. Given how little character work we've had on Hammer and Sickle, and Sickle's outburst in issue 10, I kind of took Hammer to be the slow, methodical one of the pair, while Sickle was more the fun-loving sadist. And he does look happy to have a chance to kill Maverick, but he's also learned his lesson from issue 10. Sickle will obey his master first, and get his revenge later. But he clearly knows that Omega Red is on a short leash, and driven much more single-mindedly, which creates a rift amongst our bad guys. We have a similar rift between Maverick and Red Guardian, where neither man really kind of understands the motives of the other. I think that it's interesting that Red Guardian has a case of the nerves and air sickness. Is this a bit of cold feet for a man new to his role? A sign of inexperience here? Or is he nervous for another reason? As Maverick stated, we're trusting Red Guardian at his word, and that puts Maverick in a bad spot. He has no choice but to trust Red Guardian, and that could honestly backfire on him. So far they're good, but we'll see. Hammer and Sickle compare notes about what just happened after they land. Sickle tells Hammer to inform the men that they have party crashers, but not to kill them. Sickle wants to do that himself. Hammer warns against it, picking up on Sickle's hatred clouding his judgment. 
And not only do the Jedi warn about such a thing, but Maverick warned Elena about it in regards to Sabretooth, and Elena warned Maverick about it in regards to Pushkin. A lot of anger-driven characters in this book. Y'all need to sit down and see some help. Maverick and Red Guardian reach some sort of observation room within the facility, and they scope things out. They see Omega Red and his men in the armory, they see Hammer's squad battling AIM goons near the biogenics lab, and they see Sickle setting up in the hallway before the lab. The conventional weapons are bad, but it's those anthrax ones that concern Maverick the most, neutralizing that and whatever other biohazards is their first priority. So Maverick and Red Guardian will split up. Red Guardian can head through those oh-so-conveniently-sized ventilation ducts to get into the biogenics lab and destroy the samples. Maverick will go handle Sickle, hopefully keeping him occupied long enough for the Red Guardian to accomplish the mission. Red Guardian can see the animosity between Maverick and Sickle, though, and thinks that that part of the plan is suspect. Maverick can see no other way to do this, though, and basically runs out of the room, forcing Red Guardian to agree with the plan. There's that tactical mind at work again. I think we also see Red Guardian's inexperience here, as he not only lets Maverick make the plan, but he follows through with it as well. Maverick finds Sickle, and they fight. With the added power of his charged-up fists, Maverick handles the thin man easily, wrapping his hands around Sickle's neck. Beaten, frustrated, even Sickle taunts Maverick. Go on! Finish it, hero. You don't have it in you. Maverick lifts him into the air. And then he lets Sickle drop. No. Maverick doesn't kill people in cold blood. He then tells Sickle to tell Hammer that he's coming. Hammer is going to pay for killing Major Barrington. He then leaves the unconscious Sickle and heads out. I am not sure how I feel about this moment. On the one hand, I'm always glad to see a person choose not to kill. No one is above the law, or at least they shouldn't be, and a hero should always choose the more righteous path. But, on the other hand, Maverick isn't a hero, he's a mercenary. He is a former freedom fighter in a war, he's been an assassin, a soldier, he has totally killed people throughout his life. To be fair, I can't remember the last past person that Maverick outright killed, so he may have turned over a new leaf. But Killing Sickle wouldn't have been in cold blood, they were engaged in combat. And it would have put a murderer out of the world for good and deprived Pushkin of an able lieutenant. Much like the argument that the Batman should finally just kill the Joker because he can't be redeemed, I don't see a downside here. Kill this creep and be done with it, Maverick. Again, this is more of a spy story, right? And James Bond definitely killed people, so why can't Maverick? Now that my bloodthirstiness has been fully revealed, we bounce to sunny Altamont Springs. Brian has taken Maverick's place at Elena's side for the past week, talking to her, reading to her, and sometimes just listening to music. So far, though, there's been no change. At least in Elena. Pain suddenly spikes through Brian's mind, this migraine nearly knocking him out. They've been increasing in their frequency ever since Brian's adventure at Dr. Keller's. Brian holds up his chatterbox. He really wants to call Maverick, but he also knows that Maverick was dealing with some personal stuff. He resists the urge to call, but he does wish that Maverick would return soon. Well, this is a pretty short economical scene, catching us back up on Brian for what happens later in this issue. This is just setting the stage, kind of reminding us, oh yeah, these characters are here, and they exist. Pushkin's forces have remained hard at work in the AIM base. Omega Red has been releasing his death spore at his leisure, thanks to the captured prisoners, and his Alpha team have nearly finished transporting the munitions. Despite having been closer to Hammer and better friends with Hammer, Sickle limps to Omega Red instead and warns him about Maverick. Unimpressed at Sickle's weakness, Omega Red charges off. He did as Pushkin asked. Now he's on his own time. At the Biogenics Lab, Hammer's team is moving the stealth missiles. 
They're totally unaware of Red Guardian's presence in the control booth as he sets up the procedure that will destroy the biohazard elements. Red Guardian cannot finish the job, though, without first hitting the switch, which is on the opposite side of the room, past Hammer. Running out of time, Red Guardian can't see any other way to do this. He risks being caught and tries to dash across the room. Hammer does spot him, though, and he starts to back Red Guardian into a corner. But Maverick drops in from the vents, charging as he lands, and then he confronts Hammer. The big man swings his energy weapon over his head, and it smashes through several levels of lab above Maverick. I'm not sure how that works, but they fall, pinning him, and it's bought Red Guardian the time that he needed. He makes it to the button, presses it, and ha! At least Pushkin won't get those biohazard weapons. Hammer then pins Red Guardian against the console and swings again, this time smashing the head of his weapon into Red Guardian's left leg. The lower limb shatters, and Red Guardian passes out from the pain. Hammer turns to his men, ordering them to get the last of the missiles out, at least. Then he orders three of his men to kill Maverick and Red Guardian, and he leaves. Wow. I kind of love how practical Hammer is here. While sure, he has reasons to be pissed at Maverick and Red Guardian, he knows that his job is to steal these missiles, not to kill them. So he leaves to make sure that his job gets done. I don't love him leaving them alive, as Hammer could have just smashed Red Guardian's head and honestly just been done with him. Because of course, you know, Maverick melts his way out of the debris, he downs the goons that were left, and then goes to help the Red Guardian. He helps Red Guardian up, but the wounded man protests. He is a liability now. Just leave him. Maverick, of course, refuses. They have time, as Pushkin's forces still need to load their plane. Maverick gets Red Guardian to an escape pod, assuring him that it will take him to a nearby village. Red Guardian thanks Maverick and apologizes for mistrusting him. Maverick returns the jester, telling Red Guardian that he's earned Maverick's respect. Red Guardian tells Maverick his real name, and says that if he ever needs anything, contact him in Pargolovo. Finally, the pain becomes too much for him, and Red Guardian passes out. Maverick steps away, and begins to input the destination commands for the pod. He really is impressed by Red Guardian's resolve. As he's finishing his typing, though, Omega Red enters the room behind him. He's been wanting to pay Maverick back for burying him in the one-shot, and glorious day, now he can. As the pair dodge and run, Maverick reminds Omega Red that without him, he will never find the carbonadium synthesizer, implying that he can't kill Maverick. But Omega Red is so pissed off that he doesn't even care, and he can cause Maverick a lot of pain without killing him anyways. However, all of this running around and dodging gives Maverick enough time to activate Red Guardian's escape pod, and he shoots off into the sky. And at least he's safe. Omega Red manages to grab Maverick, looking forward to torturing him. He releases his death spores, and Maverick can feel himself starting to black out. He needs to get those coils off of him, which is when it hits him. Omega Red needs those coils to release his spores. They're his weak point. Now, he just needs to exploit it. Maverick insults Omega Red a few times, and, totally falling for it, the Russian slams Maverick into the ground in anger. Charged up, Maverick stands back up, and Omega Red steps back. What? Does the legacy virus make Maverick's life force not as tasty? Or maybe Red is afraid of catching it if he keeps draining Maverick? That's actually a really clever threat, and it does give Omega Red pause. This allows Maverick to dash forward and grab the tendrils, melting segments of them together. Maverick then uses his grip there to yank Omega Red forward, kick him to the side, and off of a cliff. Omega Red screams Darth Vader style. No! And he's gone. See you next time, Big Red. Having run outside during his fight with Omega Red, Maverick hears the engines for Pushkin's transport revving up. He runs to the craft, tired, 
doubting himself, but he's unwilling to quit yet. Maverick leaps onto the wheels as they retract, and he makes his way inside. He runs into some of Pushkin's goons, though, and he has to fight. Maverick holds his own until he's able to open a hatch, through which he kicks several of the men. Oh, sure, you'll kill those random Pushkin guys, but not Sickle? <sighs> Whatever, man. Maverick punches the wall for a charge-up, then he starts to melt as many weapons as he can. I, I actually think that he succeeds in destroying all of the weapons. And I mean, damn, dude, that was a lot of weapons. With his energy finally spent and the weapons destroyed, Maverick has a moment to breathe. <laughs> Psych! Sickle comes out of nowhere, saying that he smelled Maverick back here. He pins Maverick in that hatch that he opened, cursing him for ruining this job. He pries off Maverick's mask, wanting to do more than kill him. He wants an eye for an eye. Then Sickle jams his thumb into Maverick's left eye. No swearing. Still swearing. Dude, I told you, you should have killed him. That burst of pain crosses the world, jump-starting Elena back into consciousness, much to Brian's surprise. She suddenly screams, and a telepathic burst suddenly even shoves Brian away. The pain from his eye is tremendous, but Maverick can't die here. He kicks Sickle back, but doing so also launches himself outside. The landing on the wing is enough of an impact for him to recharge, so Maverick crawls, his burned, tired hands somehow gripping the smooth airplane wing, to the nearest engine and he burns through it. Smoke suddenly erupts from the breach and the plane lurches, tossing Maverick off. Both the plane and Maverick crash in the snow. Hammer organizes the survivors as best he can, salvaging what weapons they're able to. He also calls Pushkin to inform him of this... incident. His master is not pleased, but he will send transport and pickup as soon as he can. Hammer mentions that Maverick might still be alive, and he asks, Should they look for him? Pushkin says no. If he is indeed alive then Kristoff will find his own way to them eventually. Maverick is most definitely alive, although everything hurts. He wakes up on the side of the mountain in the snow, his own blood turning it red. It takes him a moment to realize why he can't see out of one eye, and then suddenly it comes back to him. If he leaves the wounded eye as it is, it will only continue to bleed. Already charged up from the impact of the fall, Maverick jams his fingers into his eye socket and cauterizes the wound. No swearing. That's some intense sh Still swearing. Right there. Brian, meanwhile, picks himself up after Elena's cyburst. He intends to call Dr. Keller, guessing that Elena and Maverick's mind link might have been reestablished now that she's awake. She murmurs Maverick's name, and Brian takes her hand. Wherever Maverick is, he'll come back to them. We then see Maverick stumble through the snow, lost, wounded, and alone in the Swiss Alps. And that is how Maverick's ongoing series ends. Which really is a great way for an issue to end, but not a series. Maverick wounded and alone on the Swiss Alps with no help of rescue? That's a pretty awesome setup. But it is super frustrating as a final issue, I'll fully admit. Elena may be out of her coma, but what does she do now? And with her conscious, does that mean that Maverick's legacy virus infection is going to go into remission again? What about Brian? How does he cope with his own powers or infection? I'll fully admit that these concerns are pretty minor in the overall scheme of things because this is Maverick's book and not the Elena and Brian comic. And I really have, like, no lingering questions about Maverick's overall narrative. He's defeated his main enemy, Pushkin, at least for now, and resolved the mystery surrounding Barrington. I would like some information regarding Vivant and what happened to paralyze him so, but that's an even more minor concern than my other minor concerns. 
I feel like the overall adventure here in issue 12 works. It feels big, like the climax of a movie, and that's pretty cool. It strangely doesn't feel like a rushed ending for a book that got cancelled. With DC's Secret Six, I could feel some details getting rushed or glossed over, but this... This just feels like Marvel published issue 12, fired the creative team, and then called it a day. So naturally, I would love to know more about how and why Maverick got cancelled. Because I kind of feel like this was built to be an ending, at least of Maverick's first year, which is why everything wraps up for the most part, but then we've got that cliffhanger ending, and that's just weird. Was it a ploy to leave the readers hanging, hoping that their demand would cause Marvel to do another volume? Had Gonzalez turned in the script already, and Marvel was unwilling to pay for rewrites or redraws to close the book up better? I will very likely never know. One odd thing about this issue is that there's an editor's note right at the start of the book. It tells us that Maverick issue 12 happens before the events of Quicksilver issue 6. And I don't know why. I have Quicksilver issue 6, and the only thing that I can think of is Omega Red's appearance in both of these stories. That feels like a really weird piece of the story to point out as an editor, too, because it's not like Quicksilver and Maverick's ongoing series ever really crossed paths. This could be editorial, trying to keep Omega Red's narrative straight, but honestly, it doesn't really matter which of these stories happens first. If the Quicksilver story happened first, then Omega Red gets beaten there and is then hired by Pushkin, or the Maverick story happens first, Omega Red gets beaten there, and is then recruited for the Quicksilver story. Either way could work. Having reached the end of Maverick's ongoing series and his years-long journey to his own solo book, I'm left with a bevy of emotions and thoughts. I had originally written them as part of this episode. I even recorded it, too. But that pushed the length of the episode to over an hour, and that's longer than I would like. But I do want to get those ideas out of my head and pitch my ending for the series. So I hope that you aren't sick of this yet, because we've got another episode. Join me next week as we wrap up all of this in our last episode on Maverick's ongoing series, Mission Complete. Everyone, there are a million podcasts vying for your time and attention, and I'd like to thank you for listening to mine. If you would like to get in touch with me to share a concern, request a series, compliment me, berate me, whatever you like, send me an email at cbbreakdown at gmail.com. Otherwise, thanks for listening. 